Hello everybody, good evening and welcome to Milton Keynes Literature Festival Online uh, and welcome to the third of our spring summer season Zoom events. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we are joined tonight uh, by not one but five very special guests from the 100 Voices for 100 Years project. Uh, the project started back in 2018 as a celebration of 100 years of female suffrage in the UK. Uh, as the brainchild of Miranda Roszkowski, who is one of our guests this evening. Uh, and the idea was to invite 100 women, uh, 100 female identifying writers, in, in Miranda's preferred phrase, to tell their own stories, uh, demonstrating the diversity of of womanhood and women's experiences in contemporary Britain. Uh, this began as a podcast where a different story was put online every day for 100 days. Uh, since then, the project has diversified into several other forms. Uh, it's currently being collated into a printed book uh, as an anthology, which you'll be able to buy early next year from Unbound Books. That's a crowdsourced publisher. And shortly, I will put the link for that into the chat window so you can all go and pre-order yourself a copy uh, and if you'd like to go the extra mile and pledge a little uh, <coughs> you can actually get your name printed in the back of this as well um, but this evening rather, rather than a, a recording or a book we have five of the contributors to the project with us very much live uh, various different places around the country joining us by the wonders of zoom uh, and rather than me rabbiting on for, for 60 minutes, without further delay, I shall hand over to Miranda Roszkowski to introduce them all. Miranda, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Dave, and thank you, John. <laughs> um, we're, we're really thrilled to be with you um, this evening and, um, and so glad to be able to do this. Um, we were just saying how, how nice it is to, to come together on Zoom um, no matter where we are in the country. I'm on my narrowboat in Macclesfield, um, hence the kind of slightly odd backdrop. It's it's real <laughs> and uh, we're currently on the water, but luckily it's not a very windy day, so I shouldn't be bobbing up and down too much. Um, I just wanted to say a quick word about the project. I mean, Dave, you described it really beautifully um, and um, and then I'm going to introduce you to our, our readers and um, let them uh, explain themselves in their own words, because it's really all about um, giving people, women, the opportunity to tell their stories in their own way. Um, I started thinking about the project as we were coming up to the anniversary of um, the, the centenary of um, women's suffrage, uh, as Dave said, um, in late, probably tw 2017. Um, I used to have a badge that said votes for women that I got in the parliamentary bookshop in Westminster, if you're ever around there. It's, uh, it's a very nice bookshop. And um, I would go places and people would say to me, what's the point in that? Um, and, uh, you know, people do, do ask you some random questions. Um, and I sort of made me, made me think, well, what, what is the point in celebrating the fact that we, we've got the vote, um, now? Um, and as we were coming up to the anniversary, I thought it was really vital to kind of have a, a look at where we were at as um, female identifying individuals in the UK and um, what occurred to me is that although we've come so far in a hundred years and 103 years now we still haven't quite realized perhaps what the original um, campaigners for women's suffrage were, were hoping which was um, parity with men um, if you look at um, the Houses of Parliament themselves, 30% of MPs are women. Um, if you look at the stories we're told on stage and screen, they are in the majority um, uh, male-led. There are obviously women on film, um, but I would say the stories where the female is the protagonist um, and also that the script is written by a woman is um, in 
the 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 under sort of ten percent category and um even in the world of literature um which is getting a, a lot better and and female authors are are certainly um pulling their weight um and in at the award ceremonies at the moment but over the last decade i would say they've been really underrepresented in in the kind of the major awards and what really gets me is that table at bookshops when you first walk into waterstones and you look at that table and it's all books by men and that really frustrates me um because i think that the stories we tell each other as a society drive how we treat each other as a society so that i i thought it was really important to give people a platform to tell their own story and um I was really lucky in that the first people I, I, I aired this idea with said that that was a good idea. Um, and so I started by approaching my small network of writer friends and people I met. Um, I met one of the writers in the swimming pool, um, as I've said on a previous Zoom event. We're not sure if either of us were wearing clothes at the time, but I ever heard her talking. <laughs> on the phone about being a writer and I said oh you're a female writer I need you for a project that I'm doing um the ambition was to to find a hundred people at the start we didn't have a hundred people um we had about 30 stories lined up and I just um fervently hoped that um that number would grow it did we got loads of support for our podcast um and with people listening around the world and um the qualities of the quality of the stories was so strong it, it always surprised me uh I was immensely privilege to to get those stories first before anybody else had heard them um that when when the project ended i i kind of didn't didn't want it to end there the strength of of these kind of testimonies i thought should should be shared with with more people than than we had reached with the podcast so over the last two years we've been fundraising with unbound which is um as they've said a, a crowdfunding publisher and um, people pledge um, to to buy a book or they might want to to get a bigger reward um, and if enough people pledge you reach your target and then you get published um, so we are now um, in the next stage um, I've just had an email from Unbound today introducing our new editor um, who's gonna send us some edits um, in the next week or two um, so we're, we're now going through the process and it's really exciting to be in this next stage um, so that's kind of a, a bit about the project and happy to answer any questions about how we how we did it all as we go through um, but I think you'll probably want to see or hear what it's all about really and um and so we've got emma abza usha and kate here um i'm gonna ask emma to to start us off in a second um emma i think was the third or fourth story on the podcast yeah. you were right at the mind. beginning yeah. uh and you were a <laughs> lifesaver you know because <laughs> at the beginning you, we didn't know if it was gonna make a go of it and um and I got introduced to you through um, uh, a friend uh, who I'd I'd met, uh, and I was just so thrilled to to have a story like this um, as one of the first podcasts. Um, so I'm going to hand over to to Emma, and and maybe if you could just uh, explain a bit about your your writing and um, and then share your story. Yeah, okay, I'd love to. Thank you very much, Miranda. Um, so my name is Emma Halliday. I am from Leeds, but I'm currently based in East London until a week today, and then I moved back to Leeds, decided to make the move back. Um, ha having a year in lockdown in London um, actually made me kind of reassess what's important to me, and that's friends and family. And we've got someone on today, so hi, everyone. And um, I um, write a, um, a blog, and I blogged for, um, I've had many blogs, and the latest blog that I've got, which is called This Vulnerable Life, I started that a few years ago, and it was um, called um, a Be My Year of Vulnerability, and it was more about doing things that scared me and opening up more just to see kind of what life I would get. And then after that year, I really enjoyed it, so I changed 
um, the title. And so when my friend got in touch with me saying, oh, they're looking for writers, I didn't see myself as a writer that way because it was just blogging about myself and my life and, and that was it, my opinions. But um, it's been really fantastic um, being involved in this. And um, yeah, I've, 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 I've spoken at a book club. This is the first time on Zoom and I've done an, an Instagram live as well. So uh, constantly um, challenging my vulnerability here <laughs> and being open. Um, so yeah, when I um, got asked to write something that was something that was important to me, there, there was one thing that really stood out and it was, um, and, and I'll read that to you now. So in July 2015, I held an event in my hometown, Leeds. The event was called Sunday Best. The slogan, be your best on your own terms. I found the venue, got an additional four speakers to join me and had people buy tickets. My nerves tried to take over as I stood up and addressed the room. I'd like to say a sea of people were there, but there were about 20 people, including the speakers. So maybe a puddle of people, but people nonetheless. So I'm going to read you the part of my intro, the same words that I read to that stream of people. I've upgraded them from the puddle. Who here has got an item, be it an outfit, jewellery, perfume, that they absolutely love, but they save for special occasions? Those special occasions that rarely come. I know I have. A tragedy last year led me to reminisce about my life and I dug out a diary that I had kept from my ages 11 to 15 years old. One page in the diary stopped me in my tracks. It was written by 15 year old me and it said, my mother died in February. It was so sudden, not a lot of people know about it and I can't bring myself to tell them. All the family are coping as best they can. My whole life has been turned upside down. She was so healthy one moment the next minute she had died. We have to look to the future now. And since my mother's death, she's made me realize I need to have fun now as I'm only young once. I don't care what people think about me no more. It's my life and I'll live it the way I want. And I did. Well, for a few months until I started listening to the world telling me to live normal, I started caring what people thought. As the years went by and faced with another tragedy, I took two steps forward to live in the life that I wanted. And as the dust settled, one step back. This pattern continued with every tragedy and there were quite a few. And it was two steps forward, one step back. So there was more to that intro, but I just wanted to share a part of it. It was as it was truly a powerful moment and one of the proudest moments of my life because it hasn't always been like that. And I'll let another story explain why. My voice quivered as the words started to jump around on the page. It didn't help keep the paper still. As, soon, as the sun boomed, beamed into the classroom and the sweat rolled down my chest, I let out a wheeze mid-sentence and started to fall. This was my first proper public speaking outing in front of my class whilst reading my book report, whilst reading my book report to a class of teenagers. Teenagers. They were like a pack of hyenas waiting for the next prey to fall, or in my case, faint. That episode clung to my life, clung to me for more than half of my life. It stopped me going to university and I said no to interviews if I had to do a presentation. It had started to seep into my mindset, getting me down, scared to even say my own name in meetings, my own name. Until I couldn't face it anymore, I had to take ownership of public speaking. I found a fear of public speaking class in Sheffield. I was too embarrassed to go to Leeds because why someone saw me. Today, I probably spend about 70% of my job giving presentations. I found my voice and with that, I found that many doors opened and my confidence soared. Plus, I got to create Sunday Best, which will always hold a special place in my heart. Not only did I stand up and speak, but I spoke from my heart about matters that meant to me so much. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Emma Halliday, and I'm still afraid of public speaking. Thank you very much. I'll hand back over to Miranda and take any questions at the end.
I've got my got my clap emoji going there. I saw that. that was clever. That's good. <laughs> it's a bit harder, isn't it, on Zoom to to get feedback? But um, everyone that I saw was enthralled by that. And and what I just I just really love about listening to that story is is the vulnerability. But um, one one thing that I asked everybody um, to to write about when we were doing the podcast was about achievement and also finding your voice it's so hard to talk about achievement isn't it but um yeah. i i think that you 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 your piece is so inspiring for that reason right because it's it's obviously coming from a place where you've had to you've had to really learn that um and you still push yourself you were doing a stand up um comedy course weren't last, you? Feb last february yeah i don't know glutton for punishment yeah, i did a, a seven week um course and then with a 5 minute um stand up presentation well presentation just like trying to make people laugh and uh utilize my uh um being from yorkshire and just uh really taking the mick out of people from yorkshire because we're a proud bunch see deep down <laughs> no, not too deep i, I ha haven't met a lot of yorkshire people <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, thank you so much so, thank you so much for, for reading that and, and for being involved in in the project um and you. you've done loads as well to to kind of to promote it and um we always see lots of your friends on these calls so thanks yeah, thank massive you. thanks for emma i'm gonna um i'll move on i think to to abza and then and then please everybody like ask questions at the end um if or you put them in the in the in the chat and we're happy to take them as we go along um but abda is one of um our newest additions to to the collection and uh, i'm really thrilled that um sort of it, a lot of the project was um so it came from people I met on social media and after I found you know we were connected on social media um and um I approached you <laughs> and uh, and you thankfully said that you were interested in the project and um that was probably uh about 2019 I think so you kind of been it's yeah, it for yeah a it's while. been a while. I think it's been at least about eighteen months. I think. Yeah. Um. So. So. Um. Maybe. Maybe if you can kind of in introduce yourself and also, um, your piece. Um. Obviously, didn't exist until we made the book. Um. So maybe if you could kind of talk about why why you chose to to use this piece and um and the format that it's in because I think that surprised you when you you came to write it as well. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, my name's Abda Khan. Um, uh, speak a little bit about myself. I won't take too long. Um, I am actually a lawyer turned writer. So I started writing fiction uh, probably about seven or eight years ago now. Um, I'm a published author. So I've got two books published. One is Stained and one is called Razia. Uh, and I've just finished writing my next novel. So we'll see where that goes. Um, I, I tend to write about quite different issues. Um, I started writing because of a lot of the women that I'd come across actually through my career and my voluntary work uh, and some of the problems that, um, you know, that they presented with. And I didn't feel as though there was um, enough representation of some of these issues and some of these characters in contemporary British fiction. I was told to talk about my achievements. Um, I hate doing that, but um, I was British Muslim Woman of the Year in 2019, um, which I guess is an achievement. Um, and it was nice actually to be recognised, thank you, by my own community when I write about such difficult issues like so-called honour-based violence and things like that. So that was that was lovely. Um, and I was um, shortlisted for the Lifetime Achievement Award with the Law Society uh, last year. And um, and that's enough. <laughs> if you want to connect with me, please do so on Twitter. Um, I'm at Abdicon5. It'd be lovely to connect with, with you there. Uh, so the piece I, I have contributed, um, I don't normally, I write poetry, but I don't normally share it. So I write fiction and I love writing novels. And that's what I do share. And I also write um, other pieces of fiction and non-fiction um, commissions and things like that. Um, and I teach creative writing as well, actually. Um, 
But uh, poetry, I usually write to sort of help me through issues and, and deal with things. So um, I decided to be really brave. <laughs> I'm not very brave when it comes to poetry. I'm really brave when it comes to, to my novels, and I tend to speak all day about them and read from the books, but not so brave when it comes to my poetry, because I think you make yourself very vulnerable uh, when, you, when you write and share poetry. So this, um, I don't want to say too much about what it's about. I think it will unfold us what it's about, but it's, it was about achievements and I decided to write about this achievement, which was coming to terms with this particular issue, which I'm going to uh, uh, read about in the form of a poem. And if anybody wants to talk about it later on, then, you know, we, we definitely can. Um, and it's something that affects a lot of people. And I thought I would use this um, channel to kind of like bring it, bring it to the fore in a way, um, because I think so many times we don't speak about this. So. It's a poem and it's called Worth So Much More. I don't recall when it started, much less did I understand why. First, the little things seemed so tricky as though I was a child again. Simple chores turned into mammoth tasks, my brain, brain hurt thinking, why? The mountain ahead grew taller and bigger. Feelings of stupidity festered inside, overtaken only by the urge to cry. Why are you so pathetic? Just look at you. The words run around in my head. Unable to do or say anything right, my mind was awash with self-doubt and my body felt hollow inside. I wonder what would happen, I asked myself. If I just stepped out in front of the bus. If I fell off the bridge and onto the tracks. If my car veered off to one side of the road. Would it all end, finish, stop? I looked at my children and with a jolt I knew I had to reach out, I had to get help before I drowned without a sound. You are unwell, my dear, he said. You must not be so hard on yourself. He looked and listened, he helped and healed. The scars buried deep rose up to speak of the trauma so raw, never allowed to heal. Depression, he said. You are depressed. Emotional wounds you have suppressed, so much so that your brain now hurts, your heart now aches, and your body now shakes. You must rest and you must heal. You will recover and you will feel your life is precious. It means a great deal. Whatever pain I've endured, whatever injustice and cruelty came before, I will no longer allow it to define who I am, for I am worth so much more. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> clap emoji. Um, th thank you so much for that for that reading, Abza, and. Um, that, well, that's the first time I've heard that read out loud. I've obviously read it on the page, but um, yeah. have, having it read out is is just um, is really really special, um, and uh, it, it's a pleasure for me and, and um, I think everybody here. So so thank you for that. Um, it's really interesting, kind of what you were saying about poetry and vulnerability, and what Emma was saying before. You know, when we talk about achievement, we become very vulnerable um uh it, well we seem to the people <laughs> gathered here I don't know if everybody feels that way and I don't know if that's specific to being a woman or being British or um maybe we'll get into that later with with mm. the the audience as well what people think but um it, you do expose your yourself when you talk about being proud of something um and quite often I found with this book people are proudest of of being resilient and there is so so much resilience in this book mm, and mm. um you know what better time to to get that book out there when we've had the year that we've had so um I absolutely think and I think I think when you we talk about achievement I I could have talked about achievement in the sense that where I've come from because obviously daughter of immigrants and grew up in poverty and all that but for me I think the, the depression I, I, and I think it's you know, it, it's so common, but we, we don't really talk about it. So I just wanted to use this as a way to maybe 
have that as a, and, and like tonight, obviously, we might talk about it. So it's good in a way to, to talk, bring these things out, I think. Uh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it, it, it is it's relatable, I think, and uh, everybody, um, you know, not maybe everybody has suffered from depression, um, hopefully, um, but uh, there's, there's a lot in that poem for, for everyone, I think. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on to, to our next reader, um, and, and that's going to be Usha. Um, and Usha, um, you, you've kind of been, been with us um, all, all along as well. And, um, and we'll, we can see from the amount of people that know Usha tonight, um, you've been another one of our amazing um, kind of fundraisers and like cheerleaders. You, you've really been there for us the whole way through. And, and it's such, such a pleasure to have, have you read at these events. Um, we've done a couple of events, I think. Um, the the first one was the uh, I think the stay at home literature festival last year, which was um, just the first few weeks of of being at home, um, and um, and that was kind of a, a, an interesting experience. So um, maybe we can um, talk about that afterwards. But I'm gonna hand over to you to to talk about you and your writing, and if you can give us a quick intro to your piece and then maybe read it, that would be wonderful. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. Good evening. Well, um, I met uh, Miranda through uh, Birkbeck College when we all um, were on the course together, together with Kate Lockwood, who is the, the next reader. Um, and when Miranda came up with this idea of 100 voices for 100 years, I, I just totally believed in it right from the day one. I was completely locked into that one. So, um, yeah, as, as I felt that passion about it and, um, um, and I just wanted to contribute and I'm glad that I was able to do that. So thank you for having me here tonight. My story, Fork and Knife, is um, about one of the first experiences that I had when I arrived in this country um, and is during the first week of my, um, my time in Honiton in Devon. Um, I was there with family and other refugees. So I'm in a Ugandan nation. Uh, and uh, when I arrived in this country, I, I kind of adapted, tried to adapt to Western way of living quite straight away because I was only a young and teenager. So, um, but uh, the first week of it, I was rather criticized quite a bit of, of being so, um, becoming westernized within 24 hours so this is one of my experiences from 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 that week in Honiton in Devon. Fork and Knife, November 1972. I was sitting in the kitchen with my sister having lunch when our brother approached. Look at what Dutali is up to now, he said to his standing friends. Jaldika, fetch bar and my sister sprinted. Your feet haven't touched the English soil yet, and already you've become one of them. The soldiers at the barracks had emptied the bunk for us. My beddings were so much cosier than at home. It smelled of fresh snow and of England. My new hair at home, I shouted in my head. Bar had taken to Mrs. Smith's kitchen with vigour, ordering women about in Gujarati like she was the boss. Within a day, she was ladling dal, spooning rice, turning piping hot chapatis to make a way for the refugees to adapt. Her discovery of washing up liquid, gas hobs and fancy tea towers were a prize for taking care of the kitchen. The hills outside were white and picturesque. Inside, sitting opposite me, were three blonde soldiers with sky blue eyes. Until now, I had not met a blonde or snow. They could have been brothers, athlete looking and drop dead gorgeous. One of them had been glancing at me and I returned an impetuous cheeky smile, noticing my breasts had a mind of their own. And when his eyes, his white eyes, uh, I, his white eyelashes fell on his perfect moon face, I was hypnotized. I was so sure that he winked at me to stop me staring at him. How is it fair that God made him so pure and gave him the manners to eat with fork 
and knife instead of hands. He tasted his foods with his eyes, moving his Adam's apple like the chickens had next door, which was broiled uh, the day before we left England. The blondes were sprinkling brown sauce over their chips, and I craved for chili sauce to pour over my cassava chips when Ba came and stood next to me. Look at your Dutali eating with fork and knife, my brother moaned. What's wrong? I said. I'm only copying them. I was pointing at the, at the trio and Ba sighed hard at my brother. There and then I had an idea that an arranged marriage with the moon face would be most suited instead of Ramesh from India, who, by the way, did not word, speak a word of English. I know Ba found me to be a handful at times, even disappointed when I refused an arranged marriage. I would be awfully miserable, I said, but I know that I made her even more miserable. Besides, I thought, who wants the hassle of lousy dowry, the purpose of which I never understood? And Ba and I and the houseboy Kikula had toiled at selling papadoms and chips to pay for her flights to India to visit our anima. But today I could see Ba for once was on my side. Don't make a scene here, Dikla, she said, tucking her purple uh, toes into her sandals. We are indebted to these kind people. Without them, where do you think we would have gone? Who was going to feed us or house us? She said, controlling herself from welling up. She pulled her yellow sari over her head while clasping her hands and turned to my idols as if thanking them for saving me and my sisters from being raped. She told us later that my, she had hidden, hidden her little, my little sister between her legs in between the sari when the gang of thugs broke into the, into, into the house. Thank God that my sister didn't squeal or stir. I was gloating inside, but my brother gave me an ugly frown when Ba left the kitchen again. Suddenly, I was left on my own eating potato chips and brown sauce with my fork and knife. It was then when my blue-eyed soldier came and sat close to me, smelling of Johnson's baby powder. My name is Lieutenant Hendricks, he said, and suddenly I was transfixed, speechless, like I was melting in front of him. My heart became molten, liquefied, when the blonde hairs on his arm tickled my naked arm. My body tingled as he leaned over and manoeuvred my fork from the right to the left, and then the knife from the left to the right. This is knife and fork, he said slowly. I looked at him vacantly, repeating the words after him. Hendrix, this is knife and fork, imitating the pronunciation and I giggled like a little girl. Very good, he said, with his eyes set on mine as he was leaving to join his friends who had been making fun of him along the way. Thank you. Hey, just, just love that piece. It's so vivid. You, we're right there with you, Usha, and, uh, and it's, it's gorgeous. And, um, you know, it's it's a, yeah, some more hand emoji, clap emojis, <laughs> um, and and I I just don't get tired of of hearing you read that. I think it's it's such a such an exciting piece, and and that's going to be part of a memoir that you're working on. I think yes, it is. Um, this one is written for you. It was written in the first person. Um, it's part of the story of set in Uganda. Um, and it's all about the time there rather than me. So the, this is the latter part of the novel, the last piece, which will be written in the third person. Um, so yeah, so it is included in my novel. Just not being public. I can't yet. wait. <laughs> well, hopefully that will all come, come for you very soon. Um, sorry, my internet has just got a bit glitchy. Am I coming through now? Yeah, 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 brilliant. Um, well, Asia and um, uh, all your families on this call as well. It's it's been so so brilliant to to have all of your support and um, and I I think the uh, one thing that I've found about running this project and and also crowdfunding over, over the last couple of years is how supportive everybody in this community is of each other and um, you know we've got and cat 
Katvik, hello. You, you've come to the event as well, and um, Kat's one of our writers, and, and I think that just shows, you know, how how much people are supportive of each other and um, really interested to to get involved in in, in um, hearing from the other writers as well. Um, but I will now move on to our final reading, um, which is from Kate. And um, just before I kind of hand over to you, Kate. Um, I I really was keen for you for you to come along not not least because you're another one of our our great like motivating um, writers and 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 you did so much to get this project off the ground when we were starting with the the crowdfunding um, I think you kind of brought in like twenty percent of <laughs> the total revenue if not more um, so. I, certainly at the beginning um so it's it's really really great to 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 have you here but also Kate your story is um is just so joyful and and I think it's really important to to show people that the difference of the types of stories that that we've got in this um collection there there is so much to that word achievement um and um and that can be um you know the, the really big things we've we've covered some today, um, and it can be smaller things, and it can be everything in between. So um, I'll hand over to you, Kate, to to talk about your writing and this piece. Thanks very much, Miranda. Thank you. Um, I yeah, I just wanted to say when I first knew about the project, and I also knew that it was Miranda. It was you know I. I, I I'd worked with Miranda before. I mean, I sort of knew her a bit at Birkbeck, but you used to run, and I'm sure you will again, a really wonderful um, spoken word night of short stories and poems in Hackney, which is where I, I, I used to work, um, at the, is it called the Vintage Paper Dress Shop? Upstairs there. Anyway, that's absolutely- Paper Dress Vintage, yeah, that's paper it. Paper Dress Vintage Shop. So all of that was completely up my street. So it, it was, you know, it was, I took no persuading to um, to work with Miranda on this project and also all the other wonderful people that I've met through it. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, let, let me start, just say a little bit about myself. I am Welsh, as people sort of realised earlier when my thumbs went up in the air when somebody mentioned Wales. My mum is here, that's Angela, and, um, and also other friends and family, including the person who features in uh, the, the story I'm going to read. And um, when, well, I'll, I'll come back to that, but growing up in um, Cardiff, my favourite things were books and cartwheels. Um, and then somehow I took another turn and I trained and worked um, in the NHS as a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist. Um, and I also um, sort of much more latterly have an MA in, in creative writing from Birkbeck. But I suppose the thing, the thing is that um, I, writing has always kind of been there in the background, but I'm, I'm um, I suppose being a writer wasn't the sort of thing that you did coming from my, I mean, it wasn't the sort of thing you talked about, you sort of talked about jobs and what have you. But anyway, um, I, um, I have now, have, having um, started writing, I think other people were referring to sort of thing, you know, coming, coming to things a little bit later, but I have actually sort of um, done, been doing, um, I've had, I've, why, why have I suddenly gone all sort of tongue-tied like this? I've won some awards for my short fiction, um, which, which has been great, um, including most recently the, um, I'll give it its grandest title, the Royal Society of Literature's V.S. Pritchett Short Story Prize. So that was quite, um, you yeah, know, that, that, that was a real um, boost. Um, otherwise, I've, I have stories published in um, competition anthologies, including the Brick Lane Bookshop 2020 anthology and the Bristol Prize 2017. Um, I've also got some stories on MIR Online, which is the Birkbeck in-house um, uh, online magazine. And I am working on a collection of stories, which I hope to finish in the next year. And I'm absolutely thrilled to feature in this event alongside talented and treasured friends and writing peers. Um, my story is called A Cartwheel State of Mind. Um, and when Miranda asked about, uh, my understanding of the question was that it was about a moment of achievement. So I just, the first thing that came to mind was what has become the story. Um, so I'm gonna read A Cartwheel State of Mind. I always started by standing still, feet together, 
up on my toes, arms straight, close to my sides, fists clenched, eyes on my nominated runway. I take a deep breath, feel my nostrils flare, my chest rise, and my heart going like the clappers. Then, a short, rapid run up, just five or six steps, and then I could feel the moment when propulsion and muscular poise came together. Later, I recognized this in finding the biting point on a car after I passed my driving test after five times. But at this point where propulsion and muscular poise come together, I would then twist at the waist, spring off my left foot, swing my arms up and down and out, wide as wings, and with a momentum that whipped my legs up and over in a cartwheel in midair. No hands. I'd see the ground tilt, feel the rush on my skin, and then back on my feet, bouncing, beaming, breathless. My first ever free-handed cartwheel was on the school playing fields one dinner time with my best friend, Siobhan. I did it! I did it! I screamed. You did it! You did it! She screamed. We grabbed each other and we jumped up and down. We did the same when Siobhan did her first backward somersault. It was just after the 1982 Munich Olympics. There were posters of Olga Corbett and Ludmilla Tereshiva blue tacked all over the wood chip walls of the bedroom I shared with my sister Liz. I wrote a poem dedicated to Olga and Ludmilla and my gym teacher had it printed up on card and laminated. That was on the bedroom wall too. At the time, my mum was working most evenings as a waitress and had to leave the home before my father was back from work or me and my sisters back from school. And she'd always leave a pot of potatoes peeled and ready for cutting into chips to have with a tin of baked beans or goblin beef burgers. And I still love chips gone soggy with tomato sauce or gravy. After my younger sisters had gone to bed, I'd then stay up with my dad playing a few rounds of cards. And one night he said, are you happy? And I paused. No one had ever asked me that before. I can do a cartwheel in midair, I thought. And I felt a surge of something rise up inside me and expand always, filling me with a space for all sorts of possibilities. Yes, I said, I'm happy. And the swell of exhilaration I felt then of pride and giddy joy became a lifelong benchmark of unadulterated happiness. Not long after the 2012 London Olympics, I entered my first writing competition on the theme of flight. And I wrote a story about a young woman who sees a therapist at a low point in her life and finds herself recalling an experience as a young gymnast when she flew through the air performing a vault called the Yamashita. It won first prize and it was my first ever published story. I can still turn cartwheels. Wide open spaces like beaches and fields bring them on. Of course I have to stick to the ground now and use both hands but my legs are straight, my toes pretty pointed. Not so long ago, leaving a restaurant with my husband Adam, Siobhan and her husband Roberto, who were both in the audience, Roberto Peña, um, we found ourselves on a wide, clear stretch of pavement. And I stopped and I placed my foot together, feet together even, and I rose up on my toes, arms at my sides, clenched my fists and focused on the tarmac ahead. Oh yes, said Adam, she's going to do it. And I raised my arms and stepped into the cartwheel. A bit wobbly, what with the wine we'd had and wedge sandals. But I did it and everyone cheered. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> we didn't have chips every night. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you, Angela, for confirming. <laughs> and hi to, to Siobhan and Roberto. Um, I am so thrilled that you're here because I've always wondered who, who, who Siobhan was. <laughs> um, I, I just really, really love that story, Kate. And it's so it's so joyful. Um, and uh, and as you say, it sort of it captures that moment of pride there where you're talking to your dad as well that I just I think that's that's really powerful. Um, and and it sort of makes me think, you know, if you know that you can do a cartwheel, you know, you can do anything. And and I think with all of this um, achievement, like getting getting those first stories in the podcast um, made me think that I could do a whole podcast and or and uh, or do running the short story night that I did that uh, making baby steps like that helps you to get where you want to get to. And so I thought it's so important to, to have had that story in the collection i what i also really like is that you're talking about something very physical you're talking about your body as women sometimes our bodies are kind of segmented seen as belonging to other people but um i, I wonder if you have any, any any thoughts on that and the, the kind of the empowering um kind of part part of being able to do that cartwheel and and what that has meant for you in other walks of life um, yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting that it was absolutely the first thing that, that came to mind, you know, not not sort of, you know, my training or sort of other things, because it, it was just, um, I think it was about being able to make my body something, my body do something, if, if you like, and it, it, and, and it was, um, yeah, it was a very physical thing. And it was a very magical thing, because it was something that I just never thought I'd be able to do. Um, I don't know how, how I, I guess it's similar, maybe, maybe more so for girls than boys, I don't know, but how you're kind of pigeonholed a little bit. And I think I was, um, I, I was like the brainy one, not the sporty one. So this was something I could do that was, you know, that was something else. Cause you don't, you don't want to be the brainy one. That's not very interesting. <laughs> well, of course you do in the long run, but you know, <laughs> it's not very cool, is it? You know, at school. <laughs> but, um, Sha Siobhan was a lot better than me. Sha Siobhan could do all these backward things and I could only do forwards, forwards and sideways. So I think she's contesting that. <laughs> um, but uh, I um I just thank thank all of all all of our readers. Um a beautiful selection of readings. And I know that we're on 10 2 already. That's gone quickly. Um Dave, do you want to open it up to questions now? Sure. Uh, if any of you have, have questions that you'd like to put to, to all or, or any of our readers, uh, type them into the chat window so that we can track you down in, in these, these little sub-celebrity square viewings that we've got going on in front of us. And you can put your question to, to our, our lovely guests yourself. I, I wanted to start by asking a question of Miranda in her capacity as, as editor here. Uh, because you've edited uh, previous collections and, um, and previous work let, uh, not themed in, in this way what was what was different about compiling and editing and working with a hundred female identifying writers as to opposed to just a hundred writers yeah I mean that's a great question um, so I, I suppose my, my previous editing experience is mainly in fiction uh, and um, similar to to uh, to working on um, someone mentioned the the Mechanics Institute review um, that I, I was part of the editorial team um, with people like Dave uh, and um, the the similarities are the variety of the stories but um, the, there was an overarching message here um, and and there was a reason that we wanted well I wanted to have such a, a vast collection of, of um, stories by by yeah um, women and female identifying people because um, not everyone is um, uh, a cis woman in in the collection um, and that was to prove the wealth of talent out there um, and and kind of add to the to the feeling that there is just a, a huge difference in the stories 
lived and told by women and uh we just don't get to see that variety i think uh, in um society um but another thing was um about that collective uh mentality that i i i talked about a little bit earlier everybody has been so supportive of each other as we've put this book together and um and i feel like we've got a real network and of, of friends and and kind of um comrades as as well as just being published in in a book together thank you no and that that very much struck me it I, there's a really kind of mutually supportive vibe about the five of you reading together which is really delightful um as a as a fellow writer albeit a, a fiction writer i don't write memoir uh, my experience of anthology launch events is is rather more competitive. <laughs> should I, should I say? Maybe maybe that's how people react to men rather than to women. I don't know. Uh, but but yeah, this was this was much nicer, much more congenial, uh, much more supportive is the word, uh, mutually encouraging, which is which is delightful to see. Uh, amongst people and amongst writers and, and all power to you yeah. do we do we have any questions for anybody else while we're here raise it raise a paw they've all gone bashful they've all gone really really quiet haven't they should i <laughs> shall i ask my question to the panel then do sure. you do do you think that it is especially difficult because we're we're British or perhaps because we're women to talk about achievement and big ourselves up. Um does anyone want to kind of have have any any thoughts, have a go at that? I, I, I yeah I was yeah I was gonna say I think it's something about being a woman actually because I find that even just generally I think I think we're always a I think we tend to apologize before we say anything so it's it's almost like you know when you sort of phone somebody and you say i'm really sorry to bother you you have a tendency to do that you know like you're probably not bothering them but why do we actually always so i think with achievement as well i think sometimes we're just really hesitant to to share i i, I don't know why I, I, but I feel as though it's a woman thing rather than a british thing but i don't know what anybody else thinks what do you um, think, Kate? Hey? Uh, yeah, I was. Um, well, it, I, I, I did think about this question, and I think it, it it's difficult because I think it, it's certainly a, a kind of cultural um, sort of um, cliche, maybe. But I, I, I think it is much. I, I think it, it's more complicated than that. And I agree with Abda. I think you know certainly there are certain things that make you perhaps a bit more like. <laughs> more likely to be a bit self-deprecating or a bit sort of slow coming 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 forward. And I think the other thing which I realised when I came from Cardiff to medical school in London, one of the things is education and back, you know, background. And and um and I, I what I couldn't understand is why um I mean not you know by all means not everybody at um, medical school goes to public school. Otherwise I wouldn't have had any friends but <laughs> but um um uh, well but I, I think there was just something about what what really kind of um, made some people stand out was that that, that um, there was a confidence that came with going to a particular school or having a particular background. Um, I mean, it's obviously more than that. It's to do with class. It's to do with background. It's to do with your particular unique experience. So you can't generalize. But um, but I suppose that was something about when I, it really first hit me that that there were kind of differences and not everybody went to the same sort of school as I went to or came from the same sort of background that I did which you know I mean there was um yeah so I, I'm I'm babbling now so I'll stop <laughs> well, I think I think I think you make a, a very very um important point there um but yeah it it may maybe is a bit more more for for females um Emma you want you wanted to come in I think no I was just going to um to agree um, that I don't think it's just a British woman thing. I think it's a worldwide woman thing. And I've um, travelled um, a bit and been to um, a, a lot of events. And there's uh, many women there, and from all uh, from all walks of life, and all kind of not sometimes being able to see their power or their potential 
and it, it that's where it was Kate was saying it gets a bit messy because it, it can come from many things it could be um, where they've grown up and um, the culture the family that they've been in nature and nurture and then it's they could it could be just within certain things where they've got the confidence in one thing because they know that they do something really well like make bake a cake or something like that I've got friends that can bake an excellent cake and they can big themselves up about that but they're not seeing where they they they'll be able to use their skills in other things mainly in the workplace I would say so and um, then what I've seen really like what like working uh, in the NHS I also think that society views a man and a woman can say the same thing, but I think society views them differently. So if a, if a woman is um, sort of ambitious, she's seen as like bossy or, uh, you know, um, brash, whereas a man is ambitious and a goal-getter. And I'm generalising, not everybody thinks like that, but I do feel that sometimes we can do exactly the same thing, but we can be seen differently because we're, we're women. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like people who play the field or whatever, you know, he's a stud, but she's, a, you know, I'm not, not going to use the word because I don't like any of the words that people use yeah. for women when they're trying to describe that kind of behaviour. But you see what I'm saying? It's, it's always like a, a sort of different standards almost for, for women. Yeah. I'm, I'm listening to you and remembering a moment that made two people laugh out loud afterwards. Uh, this was my first job. Uh, and I, I spent a lot of time dealing with two or three big London hotels, booking people in for a series of education conferences for a quango. And, and after the, after they'd all finished, because we'd put a lot of business their way, they phoned me one day to say, "Could we invite you over to lunch on us, just to say thank you?" We're um, obviously angling for more, more business, and do bring your secretary. Uh, so I said yes, because hey, it's a free lunch, and they do exist. And then had to go to explain to my female boss that. She was going to have to pretend to be my secretary so that we could both go and get a free dinner. They assumed I was a man, therefore I obviously was the one who had us. No, actually I was the secretary, but they couldn't wrap their heads around that. And um, mercifully, we both found it hilarious, but I confess we didn't have the nerve to correct them. We just went for the free lunch. Mm. Well, I, I, so I run a law firm for many years. I still work there, but I've handed the reins over and people would always come and ask for Mr. Khan. They would never ever assume it's a woman, and yeah. out would come Mr. Khan, and they'd look shocked, and they'll be, "Yes, I set the firm up. Yeah, I'm, I'm the founder of the firm. And, you know, I'm, Miss, I'm, I'm not a man." <laughs> so yeah, I think people just expect, don't they, that um, you know, whether when it's a business or when it's a law firm or an accountancy practice, that that, that name is going to be immediately they're going to assume it's a man, and that's happened yeah. to me. So what well, it happens to me all the time. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of having witnessed similar things and it strikes me even people who have the grace to be horribly embarrassed at, at having made such a dumb mistake still do it quite often. It, it's actually very ingrained. Uh, the, other, the other moment I remember, I, I used to work alongside a really talented graphic designer, a lovely woman called Jo. Uh, and we worked together for many years, uh, but there were two occasions where we kind of thanked each other afterwards. The first was was quite a high powered meeting with a really big corporate client, where halfway through she, I could feel her tapping on my arm and sliding me a piece of paper, which said, "Could you ask them this?" And and I I just interrupted the meeting and said, "You know, my my lovely colleague Joe has a question that that she needs to put to you so that she can she can really bring her expertise to play." And she blushed furiously, but asked her question, but she wouldn't have had the nerve to ask it. She felt somehow that as a woman, she wasn't going to be take, taken seriously as she did. Uh, but I intervened and, and let her have her voice. And thereafter, in meetings with the client, they included her in the conversation rather than her having to kind of elbow her way in or use me to speak for her. Uh, but equally, we went to a to another um, very flash event at, at BAFTA's headquarters where she realised about halfway through because she'd been to a very posh girls' school. Uh, I, I grew up in, in the wrong end of Battersea in the 60s and 70s um, and speak quite nicely now because I had a stammer as a kid so they sent me to speech therapy uh, and they, they bludgeoned the accent out of me. Uh, 
but I'm not posh. And Joe could tell that I was seriously intimidated by how posh the people we were dealing with here. And I got taken outside for a cigarette and reminded that I was as good as they, they were and I could, I could be just as articulate and get over yourself. So I think there are, there are multiple factors at play there. Uh, and we have a long way to go in, in overcoming those, those kind of prejudices and assumptions in, in daily life. But, but certainly women have that much harder than men, much, much harder. And I think you've kind of <clears throat> touched on the importance of, of allyship there, you know, and uh, where you do have a platform. Um, you know, and as a, as a white woman, I have lots of privileges and um, you know, want to um, try to help others who don't have those privileges as well um so so but we're all learning and and um and i think we're making progress i hope that through publications like this events like this we'll just get more visibility of different walks of life different people uh and that will help us undo those ingrained thought processes i think um, yeah. or at least i hope so yeah, yeah, I, it, it's behoven on all of us to just keep yeah. plugging away, I think, just keep chiseling away. And those, those unacceptable biases will, will gradually get eroded. People will just see through it all. To, Does the ask. panel have anything to add on, on any of that? <laughs> we got very philosophical there. I have an observation, not as a panel member. Um, I was very conscious of the quality of the curation as we had the, the readings this evening. And I think your question, Miranda, about um, <clears throat> the, the quality of the, the people we've got, it does reflect the, the curation. And I found I was wondering, as we heard the collection that you'd uh, brought to us, how it would be different uh, if it were the male equivalent if it was all male voices talking about the same sorts of things i don't think we would have um well of course it's all down to curation but i i suspect we were less likely to get the self-awareness and the vulnerability and the tentative exploration um <clears throat> but we might have done i mean if it, it is down to curation but I'm, i found the the presentation this evening absolutely fabulous i really enjoyed all of them and then your question about is it, is it a, a reflection of Britishness? I found I was, I was trying to imagine what it would be like if the, um, the all-female presentation team was um, Hispanic or was American or was Chinese. I mean, I'm, this is where we're exploring the depths of, of um, prejudice and, and um, compartmentalization, but I, it felt a British English tradition experience, but you're a very diverse group of presenters, so I'm not quite sure that, that um, where we should label it as being British. Um, you're five individuals. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, that is important, of course. We, we're, we're not all anything, and, and, and as you say, that's kind of, that's absolutely the point. Um, and, and I do agree with that. Um, George? Uh, male vulnerability is an important topic and I hope to see similar collections by men um, to, talking about different stories about men because we've seen we've seen a lot of the same story about men I think. Um, yes, we over have. to you I was, Dave. I was just going to throw in, I'm sorry I would google but I'm, then I'm looking the wrong way and, and being rude to everybody. Uh, one anthology of, of writing by men, if somebody, people do want to see something different, uh, which I think is another unbound anthology, it's called Being Dad. Uh, it's 20 or 30 different men writing about their experience of fatherhood. And it struck me as a great and rare example of, of shameless male vulnerability. It's like openly quite weepy and, and joyful about the experience of being a father. It's kind, the kind of thing they might say very, very drunkenly to a friend down the pub, at the I love you, you're my best mate stage, and they put it between covers in a book. Uh, so, yeah, that's one to look out for. Uh, I, 
sorry I was just going to say I love that illusion um of like saying drunkenly in the pub I, I always thought of the hundred voices it was a bit like that but like um somebody whispering in your ear late at night at a party they're uh their deepest secrets and, and proudest moments and um and I think having people who are willing to go on record and tell you all those things is is just really amazing so I'd like to thank all the all the writers of 100 voices indeed that's that's something very special and I think all five indeed all 100 of you should be very very proud um and, and thank you to all of you, and thank you to our lovely audience. This has been a wonderful, wonderful evening. I've just put the link for you to, to go and pre-order the, the anthology back in the chat, so do go and click the link before you leave, because uh, projects like this deserve your support. Um, and with any crowdfunding publication, they literally don't happen without you. They, re they really don't. It's, it's somebody's dream that you help to make come true. Uh, and this is one certainly worth supporting. Uh, so if you'd, you'd all like to unmute yourselves and give our five lovely readers a proper round of applause rather than this hand-waving nonsense, that would be a delightful way to end. Okay. <laughs> Take a bow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us and thanks to everyone who came along. It's been lovely sharing this with you. Yeah, thanks. Uh -huh. and thanks, Siobhan. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Enjoyable evening. Thank you.